Okay, hello and welcome to this week's edition of Our Stories, His Glory. Um, things are going, we're switching it up a little bit this week. As you may tell, can tell right away, you don't have to look at me. There's a picture and you're going to get to see the picture because you're going to get to see who I'm talking to this week. And I got to tell you, as I, as I introduce Audrey LeClaire here in a moment and tell you a little bit about her, this uh, lead up to this, Our Stories, His Glory, has been one of the most, uh, well, got the most response. So I, I feel like there's a lot of people going to see this before it's over. But um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Audrey, and then I'm going to let her do most of the talking. But you probably, if you've seen from some of the, the promos that I did on Facebook and on Twitter, Audrey is the daughter of Keith LeClaire. And Keith was... Um, a legendary coach at Western Carolina and then at East Carolina before uh, his life was cut short, unfortunately, by ALS, which is more commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Well, Audrey has taken up that cause, and she was a young girl when this happened, and she and I are going to be talking about some things, some remembrances of her dad, and then we're going to delve a little bit into her life and how this has uh, affected her and inspired her in many ways. So I think you'll really enjoy getting to hear from Audrey. I hope she's still on the line. Audrey LeClaire, are you there with me today? I am. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, you're welcome. I, it, uh, I think if, if people have read my little uh, Wacky Wednesday Wisdom, which I do a devotion each week, they'll know that the idea came to me while I was mowing grass one day last <laughs> week. And, and I, I had just seen a tweet from you. You were going through the ALS Awareness Month Um with your dad, basically his journey through that in May is ALS Awareness Month. And there was a post each day and I'm like, man, I, I need to get her on the show, especially in May before it turns to June so you can share all this about it. So um, I, I'm very glad you're here. And first of all, just tell me, and we're going to come back to that in a little bit, but wh what uh, what all avenues are you using for this ALS awareness? I know you're posting on Facebook. You can tell me a little bit about that and kind of, and then Twitter some too, but how did that, um, how did that come about that you decided to, to share this story? I actually saw it on Facebook through a, um, a friend that we have met in Greenville who lost her husband to ALS and she had posted that she was doing this challenge and I saw it and I was like, you know, this is a really, I think, neat idea. And a lot of the, challenge days have things that aren't talked about so much when you discuss ALS awareness. Um, and a lot of times, a lot of vulnerable things, but things that other people may not realize that families struggle with with the disease. So I had asked mom, I said, hey, I can't do all of these by myself because I don't remember everything, but would you be willing to help me out? So she agreed. So we have been kind of reaching back in those memories and pulling things out and kind of telling our story as a whole that um, a lot of people may not have realized. And we've also gotten the chance to dig back through a lot of dad's writings. And it's been kind of funny how God's worked in that, just how, you know, we're kind of looking for something and we open a devotional and a quote is right there. And it's like, well, this is perfect. And we didn't have to look long. You know, we just kind of flipped it open to that page. So it's allowed us to reflect and uh, also kind of dive into some of his devotionals as well and uh, really kind of tell, tell the whole story, the good and the bad, and uh, really create awareness more than the surface level that most everybody sees on a regular basis. Well, let's, we are going to take a trip back. You mentioned about journeying back and seeing some of the things he wrote, and we're going to go back in, in a moment or two to – before you were born, when Keith and I were, were friends, well, actually, we were competitors. But I want to stick with that, what you just said for a minute about some of the struggles, because I, I can be honest with you, I had no idea until I started reading all your posts this month. Uh, and, and God bless your mama's heart for keeping journals and, and writing all that down. And then your dad was doing a lot of writing, too. It really was a day. It was a not just a daily, day by day. It was a minute by minute challenge. As I'm watching some of the things your mom had to deal with, 
um, and other family members. And then you, you, I think people from the church came and helped too. There were nights when she was putting you guys to bed that church members were just getting, you know, a bath or just getting uh, uh, your dad fed or just getting him moved from one room to another. That's what you're sharing in those posts. And I got to tell you, they're, they're tremendously inspirational. Um, I'm certain that your mom remembers that time and remembers how many people were praying for you guys, but not only doing that, but coming over to help. How, how, how does she remember that and how do you remember that? The support that we had was incredible from close family friends to church family to other churches in the community to um, pirate fans supported us so much. Catamount fans supported us. Dad's former players. I mean, the amount of support we had was overwhelming. Um, and even then, um, I guess Dad's care team for the three and a half years of Mike and Sherry Odom, Chuck Young, Dave Kimball, Michelle Maisie, and Stuart Robertson, and Jerry Green was just I mean, they took a night, they came in, they sacrificed their time to, you know, just in a sense give mom an hour, hour or two to just not have all the pressure on herself of, hey, we're here to help. Um, and the outpouring of love was something that I don't think we could have made it five years uh, without. And I know that still to this day, the, the support has just meant so much for us. Even when we reflect back and we look at how much people embraced us, it truly is um, a testament to how we were able to make it through. And that's that's a fantastic inspirational story. You know, a lot of people, when, when something happens like this, uh, they think of the person who is afflicted with the disease, and I certainly did at that time, and you know, obviously kept Keith in my prayers every day. But the caretakers have a tremendous um, responsibility and strain, and need prayer too. So if there's any lesson I learned from your post, is um, the folks around an illness need just as much prayer as the people who have the illness, and um, and, and I think your posts are really enlightening, and I hope that people will go and take a look at them on your, on Twitter or on your uh, Facebook page. Uh, but let me let's let's go back now. Let's go further back before Audrey Allen and Claire was born, and let's go back to let's see. My, I've got some tough memories now because I was big rivals with you with Western Carolina. I went to App State as I put in one of my uh, writings. And we won the conference tournament in 84. I think your dad was a freshman then, if I remember. Nope, he was not. He was a freshman my junior year when they beat us, and then he was a sophomore when they ruined my senior year. 18 to 17, Coach uh, Leggett still talks about that game up in Color Week. Oh, and man. It, we were ahead 17 to 11 with two outs in the ninth, and Western scored seven runs to beat us 18 to 17 and win the Southern Conference Tournament. So you can tell I'm really enjoying talking about that. Um, but what happened after that from one of my posts, and I think you might have read this, is that Coach Leggett asked me to come and, and work camp for him. I became a high school coach almost immediately, and I was at West Henderson. And I was kind of surprised he would ask an Appalachian guy to come. And I got there, and it was all catamounts. I mean, it was all the guys from those teams that I had faced, and your dad was one of them. And as I wrote in my post, you know, those guys, uh, we teased each other a little bit, mainly them teasing me, and then they became uh, great friends of mine immediately as we we were working camp to the point where um, the next year when I came up, um, Keith realized uh, that I was driving back, and I was driving an hour there and an hour back each day, two hours, and he said, man, why don't you just stay with me for the week? You can stay there. I'm uh, staying in this little house. I'm engaged, and and, and I'm living there for now, and um, so I did. I, I stayed with him for a week, and uh, your mom would come by in the afternoon and work on the house a little bit and do some things, and she would leave and go back home, and uh, we just had a great week together. Now, I think I'd mentioned that to you when you came up throughout the first pitch for us before our ball game, but your mom has some memories of that time, too, when the two bachelors were there in the bachelor pad. What, what does she remember yeah. about that? She, she does, and she 
she actually remembers you having your Bible, um, walking in and seeing you studying your Bible. And I think in that at that moment, too, she was just appreciative that Dad had a friend that uh, would keep him spiritually grounded. Um, I think that was comforting to her. Um, she does. She remembers that and uh, just remembers how devoted you were to God's Word and your walk with Christ. And um, I know that she appreciates that Dad had support like that. Uh, especially because he was young back then, he was fresh out of college. So. Very young. He started coaching the day after he finished playing, uh, I think, pretty much. He, he was young. He was two years younger than me, and I thought I was really young. Yes. Um, so what's, 25. Yeah, 25, and he won all, started winning all his championships when he was, was very young. And so um, let me, let me kind of walk through the timeline here because after that um, – your dad and I would, would go recruiting together a lot. I eventually got hired as a college coach at um, at Brevard College, which wasn't too far from there. And uh, we spent a lot of time on the road together, which I really appreciated. And he still kept having me come back to camp. And I don't know if you read my post from two weeks ago, but something very interesting happened to me at a Western Carolina camp. Actually, I was over in Silva at those little uh, recreational fields. I don't know if you've seen this, but some people that read my post will remember from a couple of weeks ago. Um, the coach, I think Coach Leggett was in charge. Coach Lecle uh, Keith was assistant at the time. They put me and two other coaches with the little bitty kids, the eight-year-olds. Okay. And little Rachel was a little girl that showed up, and she was only six, but Coach Leggett decided to let her stay, and she became my absolute nemesis. And um, – <laughs> At one point in time, and, and I ended up loving her and just hugging her on the last day, but boy, she was a full-time job, and she picked up a ball one time when I was talking to everybody and chunked it at me as hard as she could at point-blank range, and it hit me right where I can't even say. Um, oh. and, and and your dad, I don't think he actually saw that, but it took about two minutes for somebody to run over and tell him the story, and he, he and the other guys really let me have it because it doubled me over. And this little kid well, got. I, <laughs> I had read that, and then I told mom, and I said, "That sounds like about the time that Dad let me go to baseball camp." And it was at ECU, and I'm pretty sure I was a handful. They tried to put me <laughs> in the outfield. I sat down, and I told them, "No, I wanted to be in the infield." Um, and I think the argument went on for about five minutes before they decided that I was going to sit in the grass until they put me in the infield. So, must be something about little girls going to baseball camp and, and wreaking havoc. <laughs> and it has a lot to do with that LeClaire determination. Um, yes. That that took has taken members of the LeClaire family a long way. That determination, and uh, I can see you sitting down in in the outfield uh, doing <laughs> that. And um, I'm actually proud of you now because it shows that you got some grit. So yes. w we move on, and then. Um, I remember you being born. Um, I remember talking to, to Keith before, and, and I was hoping that it would be September 15th because I, uh, my son was born September 15th of 1992. And I said, hey, it'd be great if she was born. And you were. It was September 15th, exactly two years later. And I think yours was 1994. I apologize. That's telling your age, but I remember it well. And I remember how proud he was, just how proud and beaming he was and you know when uh, Audrey Allen he just kept saying your your name you know over and over that's how I remembered your middle name when I saw you because I remember him um, when I saw you many years later I remember him um, saying it like that so now now you're born and he and I don't see quite as much of each other because eventually uh, a few years later, you guys moved to East Carolina. Do you remember that move? I know you were awful young, but do you remember anything about that move from Western Carolina to East Carolina? I don't really remember the move itself. Uh, I was about three when we moved. Okay. I do remember still going to baseball games at uh, the old EC baseball stadium. Uh, Mom actually had a sand pit under the metal bleachers for me to play in during the game. So I do kind of remember baseball games at ECU when I was younger and dad was still coaching, but the move itself, I don't have much memory of. 
and the wardrobe right. the wardrobe stayed the same because it was purple and gold. And yes. to this day, you're able to wear a 23 jersey, purple and gold, and still be able to represent Western Carolina and East Carolina, which I think is great. Um, Absolutely. And and I know you claim both of them equally. You don't want to conflict between the two for your loyalties, because I know you do a good job of, of representing both. Um, yes, I, I had a radio station one time when ECU and Western were playing each other, and they were asking who I wanted to win, and I said, purple and gold. There you go. That's Audrey LeClaire has figured out the way to stay on that fence, because you love them both. You don't want either one of them to lose. Um, yes. Okay, so now we go to some um, memories that won't be as uh, pleasant to revisit, and that is um, when your dad uh, first started having some health issues and then eventually was diagnosed with ALS, which is more commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, we, we talked a little bit earlier about some of the, the help that you had, you guys have from your church, but I want you to tell me, you can mention that again as well, but just tell me how, you know, it affected your family. Your dad with his faith journey was incredible, but I know it had a day-to-day -day effect and eventually he wasn't able to coach. What are your memories of that time when things first started uh, becoming apparent that he wasn't as healthy as he had been before? For me, it would have been the night that he collapsed. Um, J.D. was so young that he doesn't really remember much um, since he is he's three years younger than me. So okay. everything I experienced, he was three years younger on. Um, so for me, that was the first because um, he had an extended hospital stay with that. Uh, and that was actually when he ended up with the trach. But. Everything else, the wheelchair, the vent, the in-home nursing, the uh, constant in and out of visitors, that just became normal for both J.D. and I. Um, and we were so young that we were kind of able to quickly adapt to it. Uh, for mom, I think a lot of it was way more difficult. Uh, but she was kind of, I mean, she was determined she was not going to put him anywhere but our house. Um, he was going to stay at our house. She didn't care how. Um, and that's where, in one of the posts, when she got trached, they made her spend like a week um, proving to them that she was going to be able to do it on her own. And um, that's what she did. So I think for her, it was a bigger adaptation. Um, for J.D. and I, everything just became normal. Um, even him telling us good morning on the eye gaze, good night on the eye gaze, um, that's kind of the voice of our childhood. Uh, we don't really necessarily even remember how his voice sounded other than when we watch back videos. Um, so for him and I, I would say that most of what we remember as kids was his ALS journey. Okay. So everything from the suction machine, JD and I would argue over who got to put boost in his feeding tube. Um, that was kind of one of the highlights of our day was <laughs> getting to feed him. That's amazing. Um, yeah. yeah, so little things like that just easily became normal for us. Okay, so you have this new normal in your house. Mm -hmm. Could you could you explain, because I think some people may not know exactly what an eye gaze is. I was fascinated because I started sending emails to your dad, and he would send me emails back, and I was hearing mm -hmm. that, you know, he wasn't, able to, to have his mobility and movements away, and he would send them back, and then I learned, I've heard of this thing called an eye gaze that he had. Can you explain so people will know how he was able to communicate? And at, at this point in time, he's not able to walk or move his um, arms, but he was able to communicate. Can you explain that wonderful machine y'all had? Right, so it actually started out first. He was still able to walk with the vent, and we had a letter board. And he would point his toe to the letter and spell out words. So we did that for a long time until we had a family friend kind of tell us about the eye gaze. And it is a computer that was calibrated to his eye. Um, so it had kind of a little camera sensor. And he was able to look at a letter on the computer and type out what he wanted to say. And once he was finished, it would read aloud what he had typed or send it in an email. He had a laptop beside the eye gaze. 
um, that was connected. So that's how he was able to send emails and things like that. Or he could just have regular conversation. But back then, it was early 2000s, so we couldn't really take the eye gaze with us anywhere. Now I think they have the smaller ones that can connect to wheelchairs and um, are portable and able to move. Um, But back then, if we loaded up and went anywhere, he was going to communicate with a letter board by blinking his eye. He would point to a letter um, through each row because, I mean, he couldn't communicate at all. And he would have to blink for that's the letter he wanted um, if we went anywhere. But at home, the eye gaze was extremely helpful. And um, I think that boosted his mood and uh, helped make his journey with ALS a little easier just still allowing him to communicate. Because he was a person that, that loved to communicate and encourage people and inspire people. And uh, um, I think I'd read from one of your posts that it, it, he was frustrated before that at times because he wanted to express some things he couldn't, but then this eye gaze uh, machine gave him that opportunity. And boy, did he use it well because uh, he started sending out, as you know, devotions uh, to different ones of us. Every email that I would email him, he would email me back, and there was always a Bible verse or something inspirational in that. Um, So I I commend him for that and commend you guys for for taking care of him through that. I want to move to a a different um, night that was really special, and I remember when it happened, um, and and it was the night uh, that Western Carolina hosted Clemson. Coach Leggett brought the Tigers up to Cullowee, and Keith came back, and I know there's there's a lot of pictures online of your mom and him in the wheelchair and you and J.D., and we actually played. I was coaching at Gardner-Webb, uh, which I did until this past year, but I was coaching at Gardner-Webb at the time, and we played Western Carolina about a week later, and uh, t- that's all Todd Raleigh could talk about. He was the coach at Western at the time, and I just said, tell me what that was like. He, he said, I've never – experienced anything like that you know they pushed Keith out on the field I'll let you tell me uh, about it more but he said you know it was one of the most irrelevant games I've ever coached because I think it was a really close game maybe Clemson won by one he said but nobody really cared it was all about Keith and it was all about celebrating him and what he had done in his life and the, and the game of baseball and the competition kind of took a back seat to to that, the magic of that night. What do you remember about that night? I That was actually one of the last major road trips that Dad took and we took as a family, um, was that trip to Cullowee. And I think that in the beginning, they didn't know if he was even going to be able to make it just because he was kind of deteriorating so quickly. But he was so honored. And um, just he, he loved Todd as a friend. And the fact that Todd even thought of that to honor him. I, I know that it meant the world to him, and it meant the world to him to be back in Cullowee, because um, he loved those mountains. We all do. Yep. We all love those Cullowee mountains, and especially them playing Clemson, and, you know, it kind of brought everything back full circle with Coach Sluggett being there and um, being back at Western Carolina, but as far as memories go, just... Um, the incredible outpouring of love, again, that was shown to our family during that time. Um, and that was actually, when I went to tour Western, one of the first stops I made uh, back in 2012, 2013, was to the baseball stadium um, to see that jersey hanging on the fence, which is part of what they did. Um, and I think for me, just knowing that that's the last major trip we took as a family, uh, makes it even more special. That, that's fantastic. And I think I posted that picture of you looking at that um, that jersey in, in one of my posts earlier. I, I'm assuming that that picture came from that time where you're in your 23 and you're looking up at 23. I got to tell you, that kind of gave me chills. Um, that, was, I, I, that was actually my college graduation photos. And uh, I had thought of it. We were almost done taking my graduation photos. And I looked at my friend who was taking the pictures, and I said, I want to go to the baseball stadium. And we drove back to my apartment, and I had a 23 jersey in my apartment, and I grabbed it, and I threw it on, and we headed to the baseball stadium. And those are some of the, out of all the graduation pictures I got, 
the ones that are sealed are by far my favorite. Yeah, and and I got to tell you, they I'm glad y'all decided to do that because that that's something that gives me a great memory, especially somebody that was a rival who became a friend who got to hear how excited he was when you were born. And now to see you grow up and um, we lost your dad in 2005, I think it was. And you, you've you continued to grow and be this wonderful young lady. And you went and uh, graduated Western Carolina, correct? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Proud catamount there. You're, um, you're in, you're in pre-med. Tell me what you're doing now. I know you and I talked about it before we went on, but tell folks what you're doing now and what your plans are. I think they would love to know uh, what I already know about what you're doing and what you're going to be doing in the future. Yes, I am headed to Knoxville in July to start medical school at Lincoln Memorial um, University. So packing up and moving there, and uh, I really attribute a lot of a lot of my personal journey to dad's battle with ALS. I think that if he hadn't gone through that, I wouldn't have had so much exposure to the medical field. Um, and I have a passion for medicine. Um, I love it's for me. It's more than helping people. That is icing on the cake. But um, just the fact that you're there for people in the best of times and the worst of times. Um, you're there to advocate for them, to support them, to help comfort them, as well as offer treatment. And for me, if dad had not gotten sick and battled for five years with ALS, I don't know if this would have been my career path. Um, so I attribute a lot of my personal ambitions and goals to what he went through. And you've taken what your experience and now you're wanting to, to go help others. And I can't tell you how impressed I am. And I know you're going to be a, you're going to be great in the medical profession. Now let's, let's talk about your spiritual journey for a moment. Obviously your dad had a major impact on your, uh, your faith in the Lord. And I'm assuming your mom did too. Uh, tell us about the impact they had and maybe anybody else that you feel like really um, helped um, develop you spiritually and inspire you spiritually? For me, I grew up going to church. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I was in Sunday school, Wednesday night, church service, um, and I got baptized at an early age. Dad was actually still living, so J.D. and I both got baptized, and he got to see that. But after he died, kind of pre teens years, I really ran from God. I just had a lot of anger and didn't understand why. Because, you know, you grow up and in Sunday school, it's, it's God is so good. Um, you know, look at all the good that there is. And for me, afterwards, I was like, this isn't good. Like, I have to go through all these things in life without a death. But at the age of 17, um, that's when I fully surrendered my life to Christ. And I realized that I couldn't run, and even to this day when sometimes my personality, I'm like, this is my plan, this is how I'm going to do it, and God steps in, and he's like, nope, 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 this isn't what we're doing, this isn't what I have for you. Um, so throughout my spiritual journey, I've learned that when I am weakest, that's really when God picks me up and gives me strength. Um, and then, you know, I had to be knocked down and um, kind of wrestled for a little bit but now it's like that's where I draw my strength from that's where I draw my perseverance from and um, faith to me I couldn't be where I am today without it and uh, mom and dad were both I think my biggest influences of faith um, especially mom with her unwavering faith and she not once it, at least in front of JD and I questioned anything um, and to this day if I need somebody to pray for me, that's who I go to. She sat in the car when I took my MCAT, which is a seven-hour test, um, and prayed the entire time. So wow. both her and dad are kind of where I draw my inspiration from. Uh, just as a side one, I really do enjoy Sadie Robertson and her um, her devotions and things like that. So it's just kind of a newer person. I definitely enjoy listening to Sadie Robertson. but. 
my main are definitely mom and dad. And that is, I really appreciate you sharing that because uh, I think there's a lot of uh, people in their lifetime that have that preteen or teenage oh. kind of questioning time. And you had a lot of things thrust upon you that the ordinary person didn't. And yet, um, despite that questioning, which probably made you stronger in the long run, you you came back to the Lord and said, hey, I don't know exactly why what happened to my dad, why it did, but I still trust in you and have faith in you talking to the Lord. And then you had that rock of a mom right there beside you. I, I can't tell you what inspiration that is and should be to other moms out there that uh, your daughters, your sons, your children are are watching everything you do and they're they're seeing your faith. They're living your faith. So I really appreciate you um, you saying that. And so that that kind of leads me to um, my next question. Uh, it's kind of a two part question. What do you think your dad's legacy is, and what do you, is that what you want it to be, and what would you want it to be? And then after that, I'm going to come back and question you about yours. But talk to me about his legacy and. You know, of course, the spirituality is a part of it, but uh, just tell me what you think his legacy is and how you want people to remember him. I definitely think that he is remembered as being an outstanding baseball coach, but I think it also goes so much more um, just his spiritual growth and his spiritual encouragement that he gave to others. And uh, he really did want his players to be family. Um, so for him, I think there's a lot of lessons that he taught his players that went so much more than just on the baseball field. And even some of the messages that I've gotten throughout this ALS Awareness Month and or random times when I post things that he said is truly how much encouragement that he's given people that I didn't realize. And through whether it's, quote, devotion. Um, so I think his legacy especially because of the ALS is more of his um, strength that he drew from God and how he impacted others through that, um, I think is kind of where his legacy goes. And um, I think for him, just having all those, all the players and the great teams were just icing on cake for him. But I think the root of it is definitely his faith. That's fantastic. And he, he as we mentioned earlier, he started at a very young age. He got the, the head coaching job at Western Carolina at a very young age, mainly because of the recommendation of, of Jack Leggett. And, uh, wow, started winning those championships immediately. And you're pretty much the same age now as he was when he was on those uh, yeah. winning streaks of, of doing all that. So what do you want – what do you see Audrey LeClaire being? What do you see her becoming and what do you see her legacy being? I know it's pretty – Tough to talk to a 26-year-old or 25 at the moment. I'm sorry, you're not uh, about legacy. But what are you striving for that you want people to say about you someday? For me, I just just following the path that Christ has laid out for me and impacting others through Christ, and that through me they see Him. I think is kind of the biggest thing that I want people to remember me by. Um, not necessarily things I said or that I did. Um, but more of they look back and they see how my life uh, was lived for Christ and things that I did were for him uh, and not my own selfish ambition. That's, that's very mature for somebody your age, uh, by the way. And I know I keep talking about your age like you're a baby and, and, and you're not, but for somebody like me that's 56, um, and I will talk about that generation in a moment, but Tell me about ALS awareness. I know it's very obvious how you got started in that, but you've become quite a, uh, and you don't realize it and you probably won't acknowledge it, but you're kind of one of the faces of that, at least in this area for sure, because of your, um, there's a lot of an awareness because of you. And I know we did, you came up very graciously and your mom, when you threw out the first pitch before our game. And that was an honor for me to have you there, keep the Claire's daughter there and to have, uh, your mom there too. Um, tell me how that kind of came about and what, what you want that to become. What can people do about ALS? Why are you wanting to get the word out there? Well, first, we were honored that you invited us. We enjoyed our 
day trip up there, um, and we really appreciated it. Um, but for me, um, just losing my parent at such a young age and seeing how kind of this disease just robs people of every single physical ability, but yet they are mentally sharp and in tune, um, it's just so cool. And I think, for me, I feel like it's underfunded. I do think that awareness has grown, especially since Pete Prades and his family kind of kicked off the Ice Bucket Challenge. It got a mm-hmm. national yes. um, arc of attention. And I am forever grateful that they had that idea that it um, grew like it did. But for me, just um, I just don't want any more kids to lose a parent to it, spouses to lose a parent to it. Um, it's just such a cool way to watch somebody, and in a lot of senses, they're wasting away, um, especially physically. And for me, if I can make one person aware that wasn't before, then that's one more voice that can speak on behalf of it. And things have come such a long way as far as um, the Right to Try Act is now kind of rolling, which gives ALS patients the right to try um clinical trial medications without having to jump through all the hoops, which, you know, in a lot of ways isn't fair because by the time they, the FDA approves all of these, for a lot of patients, it's way too late. So yeah. I have just a lot of different aspects. Um, I actually volunteer at a place called Joe's Camp, um, and I don't know if many people know about it, but they're based out of Charlotte, and Joe Martin's family has um, a foundation called Joe Martin ALS Foundation, and they put on a free summer camp to kids whose parents or family members um, have been diagnosed or they have lost the ALS. And I've been fortunate and blessed to be a counselor there for the past two years, hoping I'll get back there this August, kind of waiting to get a schedule for that. Um, and for me, that's another piece of just being supportive and kind of allowing myself to be a mentor to a lot of these kids. Um, because I didn't have that when I was younger, and I tell them that all the time. I'm like, man, I wish something like this had been around when I was a kid. So for me, there's a lot of different facets. Um, I feel like ALS is underfunded as far as research goes, um, and but it's also a tricky disease. Um, when you have, you know, Cases can be either sporadic or they can be genetic, and right. the genetic cases aren't linked to the sporadic cases. And so it's kind of this back and forth of, well, we go down one road, we kind of find a breakthrough, but it doesn't help the other road. So for me, there's just a lot of different facets, and it's just so important for me because I, I know what it's like for these families, and I just I don't want any more families to have to go through it because it's not fair. It's not fair to the patient um, and it's not fair to the kids and the spouses and relatives. And I appreciate that. Again, I just, I just want to tell you something that, um, and again, I'm from a different generation. I can't remember what they called us. We were in that little thing between the baby boomers, but you're, you're, you're a millennial by one definition and a generation Z by another, depending on how they kind of classify. But, Here's what here's what I think, Audrey Leclaire. I think that your generation gets a bum rap, and and I think that and and people that read my writings, the, the two or three that do, um, they will know that I take every opportunity I can. I worked around college students ever since I got out of college myself as a coach, and now, and as an instructor, and now as a full time instructor. And I love your generation. I think you guys have. Um, dreams, goals, hopes. I don't think you're selfish like they say you are. I think you want to take on the world and make it a better place. And I defy somebody to listen to what they've heard today on this show and criticize your generation. Because if your generation, Generation Z, is like Audrey LeClaire, I have tremendous hope for the future. And I want you to know that. And I'm telling you that in front of anybody that might listen. And I'll give you kind of the last word, and then I'll, as I begin to wrap this up, is there anything else you would like for folks to know? Well, I appreciate you saying that. Um, <laughs> sometimes I feel like I could do a whole lot better, but don't we all? Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody that has read the post, that has reached out. Um, I know that our family 
has appreciated them and we've had people kind of send us pictures that we've never seen before and things like that so to anybody that has reached out or um, is listening to this I just encourage you to read up on ALS it doesn't have to necessarily be my story it could be another family story um, because they're all unique in their own little ways but um I just encourage you to just read up on it and um, just be aware. For me, that's the biggest thing is if I can just make one more person aware that I feel like I've done my job. And I thank you for coming here and help helping me help others be aware because there was no better voice than, than yours today. So, Audrey, if you will stay on the line for just a, a minute or two uh, while I wrap this up and then you and I can can speak after I finish. But folks, y'all, you've heard it today. Um, my conversation with Audrey LeClaire. And uh, for those of you who joined in somewhere in the middle, or if you clicked on somewhere in the middle, go back and listen to this from the beginning, because um, this young lady has a powerful message and um, some information that insp would inspire all of us. So I thank you for joining in and I'll, I'll be looking forward to seeing you again next week.